Welcome Emerging Markets Editor for CNN Money, John Defteros. Good afternoon. Thanks for getting the name just right. I gave her one briefing and she got the phonetics perfectly. Megan, thanks for the uh, great uh, briefing on the geopolitics of energy today. Uh, it's great to be back for the second Atlantic Council Energy Forum. I uh, first want to thank uh, His Excellency, the Minister of Energy, who I dog very often as a journalist, uh, for inviting me back. Also, Dr. Sonal Jabber, the Minister of Energy from Oman, is here. It's great to see you, OPEC Secretary General. Some of the others have been mentioned, the Executive Director of the IEA and also the Secretary General of the International Energy Forum. Uh, to illustrate the point that I've become a kind of a dog follower of this great transition or as the Director General of ARENA suggested, the great transformation. I'm going to be involved here at the uh, Atlantic Council Energy Forum, the ARENA General Assembly, uh, and then the Abu Dhabi Sustainability Week. And my colleague Becky Anderson is here. We're pleased to be back uh, for the second full, complete coverage of the Abu Dhabi Sustainable uh, Week overall. It's incredible how it sets the agenda. And to give you a taste of how it sets the agenda, uh, we take this philosophy here at CNN, we go sand to snow. So we take the content here from the Atlantic Council Energy Forum and take it into the debate of the World uh, Energy Forum and the World Economic Forum uh, as well. And in fact, we're going to be holding our fourth CNN Money Roundtable about the great energy transformation on day two of the World Economic Forum here. So we'll be taking some of the content from our debate and taking it over there uh, along with the ministers of Saudi Arabia uh, and Russia. To that point, I spent some time in Europe uh, during the holiday break and then came right back in to start covering the energy uh, debate. Uh, it was the best rally in five years for energy prices. Uh, we jumped right into that. And it was very apt because I wrote a column summarizing 2017, uh, saying, may the force be with them. Uh, I was taking a play off of Star Wars, of course, and I know The Last Jedi didn't get great reviews, but installment number four uh, of Star Wars uh, was aptly named The New Hope. And it was Obi-Wan Kenobi who said, may the force be with you. So I'm playing here, of course, may the force be with them, and that would be with Saudi Arabia, Russia, the president of OPEC, Sohail Mizrui, uh, right now. Can they carry this package that they put together at the end of 2016 through 2017 and for roll it over into 2018 or not? And what's that mean for the great energy transformation? That's the debate that we're going to have uh, here today. Uh, it goes without saying, General Jones, it's nice to see you here. I think the standard question for you is, is the room safe? Because he's the guy that can make sure it is. And he gave us assurances that it is. And Fred Kemp, congratulations on year two of the Atlantic Council Energy Forum. Becky and I are very proud of what you build in a very short period of time. And we're very glad to be affiliated with you. Uh, our roundtable is superb. But I thought off the tail end of Megan's great landscape for geopolitics, it would be only correct to invite our host today uh, to discuss with us for five, six minutes kind of the key themes that Megan brought up, where we are uh, is in his role as OPEC president, and then invite our other panelists onto the stage for debate as well. We're going to allow probably 10 to 15 minutes to take questions from the floor. So we'll raise the lights, uh, have your questions ready, and we'll make sure we get a microphone uh, to you. First, let me welcome His Excellency Suhail Awaz Mazrui, the Minister of Energy for the UAE, as you know, because he gave opening remarks, and also starting his term as the president of OPEC. A nice uh, warm, warm welcome back to the stage. Thanks. We're going to take this seat to begin. Thanks for agreeing to sit down with us to kind of set the framework. I wanted to start off very light with you, if I can. Is that okay? Um, uh, of this rally to 68 to $70 a barrel, how much of it is a risk premium? Are you guys just getting a free ride after that uh, cohesive deal at the end of 2016? I was with you in Vienna when you rolled it over uh, November 30th for another 12 months. Uh, is this built in maybe six, seven, eight dollars into a risk premium because of the uh, hot spots that we're seeing today? Well, I don't think it's uh, it's uh, it's the risk premium. It's rather it's rather the nature of of the uh, of the of the demand 
the, the, the cyclic and seasonality demand, we are in the winter. We know that uh, the, uh, the demand is, is high. We have seen that the, uh, the inventories are, are declining. So the market fundamentals signaling uh, the, uh, the, or giving the right singles, signals to the market. But I, I don't think we were hugely far apart the, 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 uh, when it comes to the prices. When, when we met, when you, if you remember, we were at the $60. So uh, whether it's 64, 62, 63, or, or reaching to 69, I think it's a nature, it's a nature of, the, of the demand. I don't think any fundamental have changed for us to reconsider or do anything or panic. Uh, I think we need to wait. We need to give the market time. We still have a little bit more than 100 million, if we believe, on, on the five years average to be removed. And until we do that, I don't think we should, uh, we should uh, talk about the price a little bit going up. And I would like to remind everyone, we started, the, the, we started 2017 when we met and when we took a decision with uh, a relatively higher prices because the year before that we were averaging around 40, 43. So we were at the range of 55, 50, 55. And in the summer, everyone was disappointing that the prices went back to 40. So we need, we need to, give the, to give the market time. I can assure you that uh, the deal and all of the OPEC and non-OPEC members, when we discussed in November, we are in for, for a full year. We are committed. The, uh, the compliance uh, rate, uh, I'm proud to, 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 to see 122% in, in November, and I think uh, in December, you, once we, we, uh, we meet and in Oman and we, uh, we look at the results, I am sure we will see uh, great numbers as well. Countries are committed and we are looking for a, a year of correction. I spoke to the Minister of Energy of uh, Russia once the OPEC meeting and with, along with the non-OPEC partners concluded. He said if we get up to $70 a barrel, we have to revisit perhaps in the first half of 2018. You're saying something completely different here. No, John, when, when you say $70 or $69 or $68, don't look at a peak in a day and say we were there. If we look at the end of 2017, and, and we were at 67, 65, 66. But what was the year average? It was 50, 54. So we always look at the average of the year because then you look at the supply and demand and you look at the five years average. We don't look at a, a price in a day and say we are uh, at a point that we need, to, uh, we need to, to do changes. We need to give the time, the market time. As I told you, the, we are at the winter, still at the winter. We need to see the second quarter and see, uh, and typically we have a softening in, in that quarter. This is the, na the nature of the market, and we need, we need to give it time. We, there is no need to panic. There is no need to do anything, uh, even if the prices go 70 or a little bit above 70 for a day or a week. That doesn't mean that the whole year is going to be 70. The geopolitical risks are high. The, the geopolitical risks are high today. Uh, the protests that we saw in Iran, supplies going out of Libya, uh, Venezuela's production is down by a million barrels, sporadic attacks in Nigeria. Isn't OPEC, for that reason, sailing you know, too close to the wind, if you will, taking the risk here uh, because of the geopolitical risks that have actually come to the fore? The geopolitical risk is always considered when you look at, at, at a price, uh, John. And you need not to generate, generalize the geopolitical risk for a whole year. We know that it, it happens in different times during the year, and the prices get signals, and it goes up and goes down as, as a result of so many parameters. This is just one of, of, of them. As I told you, the way I see it, I see the market is continuing to, is continuing to correct. We are seeing a decline in the, in the inventories, and as, as the market sees that, those are the market fundamentals 
that uh, uh, drives drives the price. I think more than what is happening, what what's happened in in uh, in, in in Iran and what's happened in, in certain countries uh, have a component. But I don't think they are driving the prices uh, to to a great extent. Two quick questions, and then we'll invite the other guest up to the uh, to the stage here. Uh, you talked about inventories. U.S. inventories went from 530 million barrels down to about 420 million barrels today. When is that process going to be completed, in your view? In the second half of 2018? I think it depends as well for, for, uh, on other parameters. Uh, are we going to, sh to see the shale oil rebouncing at what rate? Are we talking about the 400,000, or are we talking about a million plus? Well, I've seen projections from 9.8 million barrels today to maybe 10.4, 10.5 by the end of 2018. Mm -hmm. That's quite robust with the higher price, the invitations there. That is true, but again, we looked last, when I remember last year, I, I always say we've been there. And we said so, we said the same, and it didn't come up to, to the, uh, up to the, to the forecast. I think we need to give it time. There are, when the prices goes up, also, the expectations from the services companies changes. They are looking to get a share of that buck, and the uh, the uh, the nature of the of the investments. If you if you ask analysts today in the shale oil, have changed slightly. Now they are looking at profit, and they are challenging the the companies looking for a profit, not just for an investment. Last year was different. They just want to invest. And now I think after uh, many companies have lost money in this gamble, they start to uh, to, to ask serious questions about the uh, the uh, the profit of, of uh, those investments, the uh, the changes, the volatility of the market is not good when it goes twenty dollars, thirty dollars in the same year. That is, we're still. I think uh, from our experience from 2017 that the volatility was high. Yes, directionally we have corrected the market, but the job is not done. We need to do. We need to wait. We need to do a little bit more. Is it in the half of the? Is it half of the year that we we reach that point, or after that? I think we realized in OPEC that the deal is for a year. We will meet, and, and as we always meet half of the year. And we will discuss, and we will take always the right decision. But there is no rush, no need to rush and put assumptions. What are we going to do if we go this direction or that direction? I think we need to wait. There are so many fundamentals uh, working in the right direction, in my view. And I am personally optimistic about the year uh, 2018. Also, in terms of economic growth, we have seen uh, healthy growth in uh, 2017, and I don't see any reason why not this healthy growth will continue in 2018. And if that happened, the demand forecast is also going to be uh, to be healthy. And if we are in the level of 100 and 1.5 to 1.7 million, I think we will be in a good shape. Wow, that's pretty strong demand. Uh, final point here: at the end of 2016, nobody really thought. Uh, 24, now 21 producers would stay glued together. That is your job as the OPEC president to, in a sense, uh, herd all the members and make sure they stay on the same page. What do you tell the naysayers that said that OPEC collaborating with non-OPEC was really something of the past? It could never really be pulled off. I think uh, I want to tell them that uh, those countries, and, and we're glad to have uh, some, some of the ministers with us, uh, I would like to thank uh, His Excellency Dr. Ramhi for being with us. Uh, and, and I think the interest, and once they got in and they understood how we work, the, if you ask them, the, the interest is still there. They have seen the benefit of this, of this group, uh, of the OPEC group, and the collaboration have been great. The commitment from them have been great. And I see more countries actually attending. Last meeting when we met in Vienna, 30 countries uh, came, Egypt and, and, and uh, Turkmenistan, some other countries came, which means that there is a trust on this process. And there is a likelihood that that trust could lead to 
one form of another of a longer term al alignment and alliances. And that's what, we, what I personally hope to, uh, to, to achieve uh, with, uh, with all of the ministers. They commit, if, you, if they are committed, if they understand that we are not, we're not curtailers, we're just con concerned countries about uh, who are producer, concerned producers on the market stability, and they, are, they believe in the process, they have seen it, they have seen the commitment, and I don't see why we should not continue in this, in this, in this game with them and increase, increase the number. Great, nice round of applause for Suhail Mazmuri. Why don't you uh, join me in welcoming everybody else to the stage. Want to come on over as the host of this event? I think it's only uh, uh, apropos. Uh, Dan Bruyette is the Deputy Secretary of the U.S. Department of Energy. He's going to join uh, right, left uh, of the minister himself. Nice to see you here in Abu Dhabi. Nice to see you. Nice to see you, sir. Fatih Birol, I mentioned in my opening remarks, Executive Director of the International Energy Agency. Good to see him in Abu Dhabi again. Wafa Yusuf Al Zabi, the managing director of the Kuwait Petroleum Company. Nice to see you. And thank you for sharing emails with me. I appreciate it. Yeah, you're very efficient. Nice to see you. Ryan Urbaki, the State Secretary, Federal Ministry for Economic Affairs and Energy, the Federal Republic of Germany. And a familiar face here in Abu Dhabi, of course, and some of you gave opening remarks. Uh, Adnan Amin, the Director General of IRENA, the Renewable Energy uh, Agency. <laughs> You'll see a headset on your uh, chair there. Don't sit on top of it, because we all might break it. And your name tags, you can take them off. I'll circle this around. We have about uh, 45 minutes. I'd like to go to the floor uh, as well. We had a chance to hear the, uh, the energy scenario for oil at this stage uh, within OPEC, and that we don't need to spend all our time on, on oil and gas. Uh, but I, I think it would be also good for us to address this uh, transformation that we've been talking about. The title of the session is the uh, 2018 Energy Policy Agenda. As you can see here, we have a hashtag for those who are on Twitter. It's hashtag AC Energy Forum, hashtag AC Energy Forum. Uh, this is an on-the-record session, so uh, those who are on the panel are aware of that, uh, and everything is uh, fair game, including the comments that we had uh, on air here that will be uh, airing on CNN with uh, His Excellency uh, the Minister. Uh, Deputy Secretary, it would be interesting to get your views here, because we talked about this rise of shale production, uh, going perhaps from overall U.S. output of 9.8 to some 10.4, maybe 10.5 million barrels uh, a day uh, for the United States by the end of 2018. Uh, explain why this is a good thing for the rest of the world, because many are wondering why we're seeing this acceleration in the United States going full throttle, even to export uh, natural gas and perhaps oil in the future. Please. Well, thank you for that question, John, um, John. And I appreciate the opportunity to expand on that just a bit. Uh, and before I do so, if I could offer just a quick thank you to the Atlantic Council for inviting me here today, uh, and two board members in particular of the uh, Atlantic Council who I think are here, Dan Poneman and uh, Secretary Ellen Tauscher, who were quite instrumental in preparing me for uh, this new position that I've just assumed in the U.S. Uh, government. The, um, the expansion of shale gas is being driven by a number of different factors. One, obviously, is the market you know, forces. Uh, more and more countries are looking to gas to meet um, uh, clean air or, or emissions type standards that they have set for themselves. Uh, but also we have seen the, the drive and the, uh, the increase in production being driven by the use of technologies uh, that didn't exist just a few short years ago. And our role at the Department of Energy is to advance those technologies. It's one to develop them, but also to advance them and promote them and to ensure that they meet the- Isn't that the cutting edge for the U.S.? Isn't that the U.S. advantage? Uh, we, you can we even partner here in Abu Dhabi as well. We think it is. We think it is. And we want to share that, uh, those technologies. So when the president uh, talks about energy dominance, uh, that is part of what he means. Uh, it is to share the abundance that we find, not only in the, the energy source itself, in this case shale or LNG, uh, but it's a technology that helped produce and increase our, product, our production and our efficiencies. So we want to share that abundance with the world. We think that is a good thing. 
Okay, good. Uh, Fatih Birol, let's put you on the spot a little bit here. Should the U.S. be exporting natural gas? It was only 10 years ago. They were so overly dependent on, on imports. One would say, let's not let the free market uh, survive here. We should be a little bit more cautious for the sake of energy security in the United States. This is a, a real game changer to have, A, the U.S. exporting fuel, and is it a wise strategy over the longer term? Thank you, uh, John. Uh, I believe the U.S. has immense reserves of uh, gas, mainly shale gas, but also conventional gas, and it is uh, good enough to fit in the domestic markets, both for electricity generation, but also for the industry, especially chemical industry, to uh, provide uh, uh, really good outsource from that, but at the same time set to become a major LNG exporter, and we expect very soon, U.S. to be the largest LNG exporter of the world. And now, as we know, U.S. is the largest natural gas producer of the world. And very soon, U.S. will be the largest LNG exporter of the world, which will have major implications on gas markets. Well, First, it certainly will impact with the way Qatar sees the world, no doubt. Australia me, as well. Uh, many countries, but before Qatar and Australia, they will be affected, but before that, the pipeline exporters will be more affected. So uh, currently, bulk of the gas trade worldwide is made through pipelines and less by LNG. It is turning completely. More than 90% of the growth in international gas trade is coming from LNG. And US and Australia, also Qatar and Russia as well, but U.S. and Australia will be the major drivers. This has implications for the contracts, prices, geopolitics of gas, and as Megan said uh, very nicely, the foreign policy, it will be major implications. So if we talk about the transformation of energy, I would put this one together with oil, what's happening in the shale oil. Your first question to Mr. Deputy uh, uh, Secretary, U.S. being an undisputed leader of global oil and gas production is, for me, one of the major transformation of energy in the next years to come. Good. There was some question, uh, we've had this discussion in the last five years, uh, that there's going to be peak oil. Uh, we wouldn't be able to find it. We've now changed the debate completely to when is peak demand yeah. for oil. So I'd love to have you jump into that. Yeah. And I'm going to bring our other panelists as well. Yeah. When does peak demand for oil arrive in this transformation and transition that we're seeing? May I just say something before that? I think we have the Sustainable Energy Week here, no, next week. And sustainability is a very nice definition. Many of us have different definitions of sustainability, this other thing. But the word sustainability came in our jargon in 1987 by a former Norwegian prime minister making a report for the UN Secretary General called Mrs. Brutland, 1987 report. And that report, the main sustainability uh, bringing to energy, one of the main issues was reducing the share of fossil fuels in the global energy mix. So why I'm saying this, I will explain. In 1987, when this report came, to reduce the share of fossil fuels in the global energy mix, it was 81%. Oil plus gas plus coal was 81% 30 years ago. And now, last 30 years, we have made technological changes, government change, markets change, prices change, renewables are growing very strongly, which is a good news. And that 81%, after 30 years today, the share of fossil fuels in the global energy mix is still 81%. No change. So this is important. I, I'm not saying it's a good news or bad news, but this is something that we have to uh, understand. 81% in 1987, 2017, end of the 81%. The oil, you are right, in the last four years, we are discussing the, is oil demand going to peak? We believe not necessarily with the current policies. When we look at the last four years, two numbers again, global oil demand increased more than 6 million barrels per day. But more importantly, and this is very important in my view, the share of oil in the global energy mix increased as well. So we have the share of oil compared to coal, gas, renewables, nuclear, whatever it is, the share of oil is increasing. Why? 
because of what is coming from the emerging countries, it's the emerging countries. In terms of demand. Exactly. It is not, see, it's not is, on the cars. Yeah, this yeah, is a, yeah. There's a break here, though, I think, yeah. because we see China, India, and other emerging markets going headstrong into uh, renewable energy in a very large way uh, in China. So but it's bringing that energy going to power gen. This is power generation. Oil you don't think this is going to affect the, transportation, in your yeah, view? Exactly. Yeah? You exactly. don't think it's going to affect transportation? It will affect, but with the current policies, not much. Okay, I don't mean. Do you agree with that? And then I'll bring our other two panelists in. Uh, you're talking about electrification this weekend at the Arena General Assembly and yeah. the amount of money, $270 billion going into renewable investments in 2017. How much is this going to reach into transportation, light vehicles, heavy vehicles eventually, and then impact that peak oil demand? Well, you know, I, I think the first point to note is that the future is going to be electric. I think both Megan and Fred mentioned electrification. And that electricity is going to be increasingly renewable. With the prices that we're seeing for renewables in competitive auctions worldwide, they are at the lower range of fossil generation, if not even below now. And our projection for cost decreases is that renewables is going to be the most competitive. The future is going to be electric. And electrification of end use sectors is the next wave of innovation that we are beginning to see. And one of those is e-mobility. And uh, I think it's remarkable when you look at a number of very resistant legacy automakers that have now started to dramatically shift their strategy about electric vehicles for the future. The fact that I mentioned to you, we have uh, uh, in Dubai an example where we're going to install these hundreds of super fast charging stations. The fact that we have more and more highways which are going to be looking at this and the advent of renewable generated hydrogen as a medium for transportation, I think that the, the, the renewables coming into electric mobility is going to happen much quicker than anybody is expecting right now. And I think that the projections, you know, we had a very interesting meeting with Mohammed Barkindo. We, we were both in Russian Energy Week and we found ourselves on a panel with uh, President Putin. And there was gas, there was oil, there was Putin and me. And, <laughs> And I had to kind of hold up my end about what is happening. They were all convinced that this is going to take 30 years. And I told them that, you know, the history of the world is littered with people who were complacent about the space of change that is happening. So please open your eyes and actually look analytically at what it is that takes you to the tipping point. And because when that tipping point comes, it comes very quickly. And I think that that is approaching. Okay, Wafa Yusuf Al Zabi. I think it's interesting from a uh, national oil company and a very efficient one. You have some of the lowest cost production of anywhere in the world. Uh, there's two things in one question I had for you. We see oil hovering $65, $70 a barrel. As His Excellency said, we don't know if that's going to hold. A, how is that affecting your investments today? Are you going deeper into uh, traditional oil and gas production? And how do you plan for what the Director General was saying, this great transition that's taking place? Do you hold back some of that investment into fossil fuels? I think the microphone's on. It's on? Yes. Let me just first uh, stress on one thing. We believe as a national oil company that the demand for oil for con it will continue. Although that the energy mix there will be, you will see in the coming future that there will be some change uh, on the renewable side or also you will see on the coal or the, on the uh, gas side. But as a national oil company, our strategy is not only thinking on a short term basis. We are looking on a more long term basis. Uh, we have investments the plan and we are continuing to uh, implement this investment plan. In the coming five years, we are planning to invest around $112 uh, billion in oil and gas, uh, most of it in the upstream, to develop our production capacity from the current 3.2 to uh, 4 million by 2020. Also, we are developing our resources in terms of natural gas. Currently, we are producing a free gas around 200 million scuff per day. By, end of, uh, by mid of uh, this year, we are going to achieve 500 million scuff per day. By 2020, we will achieve 1 billion. And we are targeting 2.5 billion scuff by 2040. This is in terms of upstream investment. Also, in terms of downstream, so our strategy is 
going into growth in upstream, downstream, petrochemical, and the theme of our strategy is integration and diversification, also to, take, uh, to manage the risk of the volatility of the prices. And the downstream, we are growing by and uh, by mid of next year, we will achieve around 1.4 million barrel per day refining capacity inside Kuwait. Uh, we will finalize the, uh, upgrading our existing facility uh, and refinery by end of this year. Uh, by mid of next year, we will uh, um, uh, commission the new refinery, which is around 612. Uh, thousand barrel per day, and this refinery will be uh, integrated with petrochemical uh, complex. This is inside Kuwait. Also, we are investing not only inside Kuwait, we are investing outside Kuwait. Uh, we start pre-commissioning our new refinery in Vietnam. It's a, a joint venture refinery integrated with petrochemical, and uh, it will be on a commercial in the coming uh, month. Also, uh, in, uh, you will hear soon that we have also taken the final investment decision in a refinery in Oman. It's a joint venture between Kuwait, uh, uh, K which is our representative as a subsidiary is KPI and Oman Oil Company. Uh, it's a refinery with uh, 230,000 barrel per day, and it will be integrated also in the future with petrochemical. And we're seeking opportunities also uh, in the Asian countries in the refining and in petrochemical. In petrochemical business also, outside Kuwait, we are now implementing two projects in the United States and uh, in Canada. So uh, to answer your question, we are going ahead with uh, investing in oil and gas industry, uh, in oil and in gas in addition. Okay, good. I'm going to circle back to the, uh, the Minister of Energy here in the UAE to talk about the collaboration with ADNOC and also the downstream uh, production that uh, the Managing Director talked about, because I think it's very essential when it comes to demand as well, right? Because this is, this is the future, but I think we should bring in uh, Reiner Bakke of, um, of Germany. I can remember back very clearly, because I go to Germany every year to chair a, a summit, uh, about the energy transition, and when they pulled the plug on nuclear, industry was freaking out. They literally were saying, we cannot survive without nuclear energy into the mix. And then you're, the coal business is being wound down in Germany uh, as well, and you're going to renewables in a very aggressive pace. W which role will fossil fuels be serving in Germany when we hear the automakers talking about the electric transition as well? How fast is the transition in Germany that's taking place, and what can we expect over the next five years? Well, in the power sector, it has been going extremely fast. When we created our support scheme for renewables in the year 2000, we had around 6 7% renewables. End of last year, we exceeded 36%, so in only 17 years, plus 30%. That is extremely fast. It was possible because I believe that we defined long-term strategies with very clear targets. That was an important signal for investors. We showed that we are serious about meeting these targets. That was important to win the trust of investors. And we had policies that addressed the issues that were relevant at the time. At the beginning, it was very much about technological development. Back in 2000, we didn't know which technologies would work in Germany. Now we know it's mainly wind and solar. And uh, the good story is that something that I never expected to be possible, the costs have come down so dramatically that uh, solar 4.8 euro cents per kilowatt hour, wind 3.8 cents, that's the results of the last auctions. This is cheaper than any conventional uh, production of electricity. So what we are discussing now is how we're going to meet our commitments under the Paris Agreement, something that Europe is discussing and other parts of the world are discussing. And I very much agree with what Adnan said. Of course, we have to address now all the different sectors. This is much more than only the power sector. It's all the other sectors that use fossil fuels and through burning, produce CO2. And uh, I think the key is going to be, first, energy efficiency, and second, it's going to be renewables. And most likely, the renewables, the big share, is going to come from the power sector, because in the power sector, we have learned how to produce electricity uh, with renewable sources and CO2-free. 
So uh, these are the strategies now. And um, I, I just want to say something because I very often hear, well, this is about the industrialization. I think this is about modernization. We are talking about a complete big step to modernizing our transport sector, our industrial sector, our housing sector, and of course also the power sector. It's about modernization. And if you vision a world where we do not drive with diesel and gasoline anymore, where we do not heat our houses with gas or oil or coal, it's going to be a very different world, a much more modern world, and I think that's what we are working on. Good. Uh, Minister Rocky, very quickly here, because I'm going to bring in the other panelists again. What's the time frame for that? Are you looking at 30, 40, 50 years? Well, in Germany, we have the target to reduce our greenhouse gas emissions 80 to 95 percent until 2050. That's compatible with the European target. And we just, uh, December of last year, um, negotiated and made decisions on a big European package for European legislation so that Europe meets its commitments under the, under the uh, Paris Agreement with very clear targets for 2030, but it's going to be a process that is going to take a few decades. We are now making big, huge steps ahead, and we want to have reached this decarbonization more or less by the middle of the century. Minister of Energy of the UAE, uh, Mr. Mazrui, uh, this target of 50 percent from renewables in the UAE by 2050, uh, I thought it was quite visionary when you announced it, but listening to what Germany is suggesting here, do you need to revise it and be a bit more aggressive in your view? No, I don't think so. I think, I think when every country looks at, uh, at its uh, uh, energy strategy, it needs to look at what it has versus what it will import, security of supply. And it will need to look at how, uh, where is the, what is the efficiency of the energy use. Uh, and then you base, you base your strategy. We are in UAE. We are considered one of the, today one of the cleanest uh, countries, and when it comes to power generation, for example, we are using natural gas 100% almost. So, moving from 100% natural gas to a 38% natural gas and 50% uh, clean forms of energy between uh, solar 44% and 6%. Uh, nuclear is, uh, is we know in our view and in according to our uh, analysis, it's, it's, a, it's a good balanced uh, equation. But remember, this, those numbers are going to be revised every five years. So for example, now people are talking about cheap EV uh, or, or, or uh, the, the uh, electrical mobility is going to, to take over. But there are, there are challenges. When we talk about the whole, if you upscale a technology, you need to think of all of the problems associated with it. What are you going to do with the batteries? And from where are you going to bring the, the materials to make the batteries? And is it economical? Today, if you, we look at the concentrated solar panel, versus which provides some storage. So it's, it's the closest to, to, to base load compared to gas or coal or any other uh, or nuclear. And you compare it with the PV. PV is almost, almost free today. I mean, it's below two cent. That's not, uh, so it, it's, it is the cheapest form of energy ever. But the question is, what is the availability of that? And can you, as a country, depend on it solely? And I think the answer is no. You need a base load until you, you have a breakthrough in the technology and you reduce it. Three pillars which are very important for, for any policymakers. One is security of supply and reliability of that supply source. Two is the affordability you need to provide an affordable form of energy. I cannot charge here in the Emirates 30 euro cent for electricity. I'm going to be fired. <laughs> <laughs> because of the political realities. Even no, though, you, no, even no, though for, you can't be fired. But that's for, for many reasons. <laughs> for many reasons. You think, you think about it. We cannot be, I think in many countries around the world, they cannot charge 30 cent per, per kilowatt hour. It's, it's, it's a no-go uh, territory. 
Third, which is important, is the environment and the sustainability. So I think if we are achieving 70% reduction compared to gas, then we, have, we are doing maybe more than Germany because Germany, there is coal, and now there is clean coal, and there are some of the plants are still clean coal in Germany. So I think uh, UAE is going to give a balanced example, uh, a balanced policy when it comes to clean and, and fossil-based, uh, and we will adapt with the technologies as they evolve. I want to bring in Deputy Secretary uh, Briette. Uh, it was interesting, the Federal uh, Energy Regulatory Commission had a, quite a major decision here, mm -hmm. despite the fact the Trump administration put five of those members on the board. Uh, they decided to vote against the idea of the utilization of coal and nuclear plants for energy security purposes. Mm -hmm. uh, is the U.S. going to still, or this Trump administration still going to want to preserve coal and nuclear power? Uh, despite the fact the Energy Commission doesn't think it's a good idea. Yes, we will. I, I think the, the minister's comments just uh, a moment ago uh, perfectly ca capture much of the U.S. policy with regard to energy. Uh, we are an all-of-the-above country, and we will continue to pursue all forms of electric generation. But your own generation. commission suggested not a good idea. Well, what they, what they did do, keep in mind, John, that the commission had the option of doing nothing. So while they set aside for the moment Secretary Perry's idea, about protecting baseload uh, electric generation in the northeast part of our country in particular, uh, what they did do was direct the regional transmission organizations and uh, others to provide a report to the FERC as to what is happening in this marketplace. Because if you will talk to the folks who actually monitor the grid, manage the grid, uh, in the U.S. we have a unique structure, but if you talk to them directly, uh, they will admit and they acknowledge that their pricing of nuclear generation, their pricing of coal generation is distorted. So Secretary Perry's initiative was to correct an already existing distortion in the, price, in, the, in the marketplace. And that distortion is favoring certain forms of generation at the expense of coal and nuclear. So I hope that clarifies a little bit about what they did. They didn't reject it and say, do nothing or do away with it. What they did was to pursue a different path to address the very same problem. Okay, very good. I want to bring in uh, Fatih Birol and Adnan on this uh, question here, because uh, is it time to remove subsidies for renewable energy and just let the free market decide? Would coal survive in a free market in terms of pricing today? It view? really depends. And how about the carbon footprint? What, what we saw in this last, what we saw in this last winter event in the U.S. is that when natural gas prices peak. peak and that is um, due to a number of different factors. One is demand. The other is availability of supply. In the U.S., certain pipeline uh, permits are not being granted uh, or being blocked in certain cases by states. If you reduce the supply, natural gas prices will go up very high. At that point, coal is very economical and uh, will compete quite well, as does nuclear in those instances. Good. Fatih Birol, do you agree? And I'll come back to Adnan Amin, please. Now, we have today worldwide subsidies for renewables, subsidies of fossil fuels, and the renewable subsidies are about one-third of the subsidies for fossil fuels. But we talk about the transformative changes. One of them I mentioned the U.S., what's happening in the U.S., shale oil and gas. The second one, in my view, not generally renewables, but the solar power. What happened is, John, between 2014 and 2017, in three years, Globally, cost of solar is halved. I don't know any other good in the world. This cost is halved. Plus, we expect between 17 and 20, there will be another halving of the cost of solar. And this is not the fiction. Plus, when we look at the last year, more than 50% of all new ca capacity for power generation was solar, 48% other renewables, plus coal, plus gas, plus nuclear, 48 percent, solar alone, 52 percent. And this is happening, and this is happening in the countries like China, India, and the more it is done, the cheaper it will become and the less subsidy they will need. But the question, and I think Mr. Minister uh, highlighted very well, how we integrate this in the electricity system in the best and secure way, because in India, when we use electricity the most, when people come, from, come home, turn on the television, turn on the air conditioner when there is no sun. 
the demand and supply, how we are going to balance this out, an area that IEA is working very, very hard. Okay, but uh, just looking at the smartphones that have come out of the market in the last 10 years, don't we think the revolution is going to be much faster than it was in the previous 10 years, Adnan? Well, absolutely, John. You know, I, first on subsidies, let me say we welcome a world with no subsidies because renewables on power generation will outcompete every other source on the basis of the cost projections that we're seeing today. Uh, I, I, I think the latest numbers I saw for Colorado is power generation from renewables with storage of a range between 2.2 and 5 US dollar cents a kilowatt hour. That's beating anything. And that's without subsidies. So the momentum is there. But Suhail is absolutely right. You know, there's no one size fits all. You, you cannot suddenly wake up and say the sun is shining 100% solar in my country tomorrow. There has to be a variation in the different sources. But I think the central premise that we need to look at is that the future is going to be electric. So the way we generate that electricity to power you know, distribution of electricity, but also end use sectors, industry, transportation, and so on, I think that's where innovation is going to make a difference. And that's where we're seeing, for example, you know, the uh, Chinese who are known for putting a lot of money in our States much more than anybody else in, in emerging sectors, have put all of their R&D bet on mobility in electric vehicles, not one dime in internal combustion engines, because their bet is that electric mobility is going to be the future, and they're developing an industrial edge that's going to give them a leading uh, advantage. The same is happening with the way we use electricity. You talked about the smartphone. Uh, you have the advent of the uh, smart grid system. We are going to be able to plug in electric vehicles, manage electricity in ways that we had never imagined, with very uh, limited input by humanity in terms of managing that uh, electricity. There's going to be problems that are emerging. You know, Megan mentioned the issue of cybersecurity around uh, smart systems. That's going to be a big issue. But I think there are solutions for that. But the advent of big data, intelligence systems, new technology, and electricity together is going to create a momentum for innovation and change that we haven't seen for a long time. Good. Uh, Reiner, when I was in Germany last year, I was surprised that both BMW and Volkswagen, for example, said that this uh, electrification of transport, light vehicle transport, is not going to happen as fast as some are projecting. Then you see the hype around Tesla. What is the reality about percentage of a fleet? Say if I roll forward in 10 years, yeah. uh, what percentage of the fleet is actually going to be electric, in your view? Uh, allow me just to make one comment before I answer sure. your question, and that is we don't believe that as Germany, as a country, we should tell other countries what to do. We believe in cooperation, and we want to share our experience, and that's why we have cooperation with a lot of countries to talk about what our experience has been in Germany, and we don't believe that the German answer is an answer for all other countries. Just want to say that before. Now, when it comes to electrification, you know, there's, there's one German company that um, had quite some problems with their combustion engines. And uh, their, answer, <laughs> their answer is now a very aggressive strategy on electrification. Right. Uh, but it wasn't so, the problem with the engine, just how you measured the emissions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, but, but we'll see. We'll see. I mean, they are putting a lot of money now into electrification. The other company that you mentioned uh, is not that far, and uh, we'll see. And if um, Adnan is right, and I think he is right, the biggest car market in the world, China, is now putting all its eggs in electrification, battery and electric uh, uh, engines. I think this is going to have a huge impact. I don't think that we as politicians should decide on the technologies. We should set the standards, for example, the CO2 standards. And whether it's going to be hydrogen or whether it's going to be battery and electric, I don't know. That's the decision of, of, the, of the industry. But there are some decisions that are being made not right now. And China, I think, is the most important one that is going to have a huge impact on the rest of the world. And um, uh, right now, our car industry, of course, um, as it has always been saying, uh, slow, 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 you know, we have these fantastic technologies and we build these beautiful cars, but they are going to get under a lot of pressure. And if you look at VW, you see that they're moving very fast now.
Good. Let's bring the lights up if we can and see if there's any questions from the floor. I've got plenty of uh, myself in the arsenal here. Uh, if we can bring the lights up. And do we see the microphones here? Good. Any questions from the floor here? Don't be bashful on the first one. We have five minutes uh, to go. Uh, my question, I wanted to ask these three gentlemen here uh, the same question. I'm going to ask you for a 30-second answer if I can here. Uh, this is a policy agenda for 2018. What is the biggest challenge on the energy front in 2018? Fatih Birol first, then we'll work to the Deputy Secretary and come back to the, His Excellency the Minister of Energy. I think the biggest uh, challenge, and there are many, many challenges, but I would say not the challenge, but I would say the risk I see that the geopolitics and energy may be too much interwoven. This is the area that uh, uh, I wouldn't like to see. I am an energy person. I would like to see energy staying as an energy uh, uh, business. And I hope the geopolitics and energy is not uh, too much interwoven. This is an area that I would consider as a, a risk for the energy markets. OK, I know you're in a very delicate position as executive director of the IEA. I just want to try to read between the lines here. Uh, for example, that deal with Iran and the position on Iran and the position on sanctions. Should we let Iran stay? within the JCPOA? Uh, do we want it to be under the tent and engaged with the rest of the world? It's got huge energy supplies. Is that what you're talking about here when the, the conflicts? Um, there are many things in, uh, in the Middle East, in, the, in the Iran, in Asia, and uh, elsewhere. I hope uh, we will have a peaceful year for the energy world in 2018 that we discuss on oil, gas, uh, renewables, electricity integration and so on, but do not discuss the uh, uh, issues which are not related to energy, which could, in fact, uh, affect the energy business. Okay, so we should keep them uh, divorced, is what you're suggesting here, if we can. I hope it could be a happy divorce. There. So it's a, <laughs> a happy divorce. Yes. Deputy Secretary Bruyette, I'd love to hear your uh, views from the United States on this. I, I think I see more opportunity than challenge, but if I had to, um, if I had to point to a specific challenge, it's probably in the technology area. Um, you know, to uh, uh, Minister uh, Baki's comments about uh, the electrification and, and, you know, the other comments about uh, electrification, I think that could potentially be the future. The stumbling block there is clearly technology. It's moving beyond lithium. It's finding the appropriate storage. It's finding enough uh, technology to allow us to use that renewable energy more efficiently. So uh, at the Department of Energy in the U.S., that's one of our top priorities, and it's going to be one of our largest challenges, I think. I know it's not going to happen at this stage, but I think it's a question worth asking you specifically. With the U.S. going into the export market, into the LNG, mm -hmm. uh, it sounds odd, but you could be causing disruption, political disruption, in a Qatar. Uh, Iran wants to start exporting uh, gas. We see what's already happening in Venezuela. Libya is having its challenges. Mm -hmm. uh, this disruption may not be a good thing. It it very well may be that you're right. There will be some disruptions. There's always that disruption, however. It doesn't exist solely because the U.S. has become a much larger producer. We happen to think quite the opposite. The fact that we can now share that abundance, export that energy, creates security and creates stability in other parts of the world that we hope will con you know, contribute uh, to a more peaceful uh, world as a whole. Okay. Do you think that's going to be the case with you as a big export? I do. I do. I am optimistic. I'm optimistic that is the case. I guess you have to in your first week on the job. You don't want to be pessimistic. <laughs> I'm not going to go the right. other way. We know how your boss is. He's a pretty tough guy. <laughs> I, don't, I don't want to come in the crossfires of him. Although CNN does come periodically. I know he mentions us very sporadically, not very often. Every now and then I heard The list it. has gotten longer of the news organizations, which is good news. Our host is going to have the, the last thought of the roundtable here. Uh, what would you suggest is the biggest risk for 2018 or the biggest policy challenge for you? Overall, I, I, I think I am uh, I'm joining the, uh, the, the views of, of, uh, of the panel. Uh, I see 2018 as a positive year. I think the risk uh, or the, high, the, the biggest risk uh, could be uh, in, in, the, uh, in, in, in politics, which we have no control in. So political, a political uh, uh, unforeseen political issue that happened, but uh, I, I don't put a high weight on that, if you, if you ask me, because overall, I am optimistic uh, about the year. And, and uh, when it comes to energy, I think energy, it's difficult to say a year is going to change an energy landscape. Uh, we have, if you put up the price, for example, as, as, as a risk or the oil, the oil market, 
we have already uh, a plan to deal with it, and, and, and that plan has been, uh, has been working very well. So I don't see really, it's, it's the risk, but what is the probability of that risk? The probability is always low. Good, because there's extra supplies around is part of the answer, right? There is, there is a buffer of around of more than 100 million in, in the, in the, in the uh, storage above the five years average, and there is the deal, there is the, uh, the, the, the supply that is expected and the demand. So I'm not, I'm not seeing a big, a big imbalance in the market in 2017. Good, I'm gonna ask our, uh, our great organizers here to put up the chart of the last two years for North Sea Brent. Uh, we had the calamitous times of January, there we go, January 2016, when we kind of tipped into $26 a barrel. Uh, but you can see the trend line, and particularly very pronounced after you had the OPEC agreement, and then in the second half of uh, 2017 to where we are today. I'm just going to ask Fatih Birol, uh, can we hold $65 and above for 2018? Is, is it your view now that you see that trend line, we see U.S. Uh, inventories dropping, uh, what's going to be the outlook, and is this a good thing if we can hold 65? I think this growth of the prices are the Barkunda effect, I would say. Yeah. The, the Mohammed is behind it. So, uh, this is the, this is the... I, I don't think anybody's traveled the world more than he has to keep all those members uh, uh, aligned. I've got to give him a lot of credit but on I that. I should also warn you that, uh, as I have been saying since a couple of uh, years, at least two years, the higher the prices, the more shade oil will come. So uh, therefore, uh, we, since two years, we are seeing a different game here. The U.S. shade oil will come and put a pressure, downward pressure on the prices. And again, the job of the new OPEC president, our successful uh, Secretary General, may be even uh, more challenging. So this high prices will induce more production growth in U.S. and uh, elsewhere. And U.S. is not the only place, Canada, uh, Brazil, mm -hmm. uh, other countries may also contribute to that. So uh, 65 to 70 is good for the producers for now to enjoy, but there will be a reaction from uh, uh, the non-OPEC supply, maybe rather strong, led by the United States this year and beyond. I wasn't going to circle back to Your Excellency, but I think I have to. That's going to make your job as OPEC president pretty difficult, right? I think we need to, when we look at uh, when we look at prices we look we look at the year average and the year average of 2017 let's not be mistaken is is 54 so we are I think far from reaching a conclusion that a year average is this price so uh, I think if the year average is a certain price that is very high maybe we are in that situation but we are at the beginning of the deal as I said earlier, we are committed. We have a one-year uh, agreement. We're going to meet in June. And this group of responsible countries of OPEC and non-OPEC, they will always make the right decision for, for, for the sustainability of the market, uh, of the market uh, conditions and, and, and balance. Okay. So I'm not and John, one thing I should mention, I forgot. Keep an eye on Venezuelan numbers. Venezuela is now registering the largest in the history the oil production decline in an unplanned manner. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what kind of surprises further decline in Venezuela may be a surprise uh, this year that uh, the oil analysts and the organizations need to keep an eye on that. So it's, it could fall further in terms of its output because there's been a million barrels knocked off already. There is what we see, what we hear, there is almost no activity no drilling, no financing, so this, this could be a natural uh, result of that. Okay, very good. Uh, let's give a nice round of applause for our panel for answering all the questions and the policy agenda for 2018. I'm gonna welcome you off the stage in one second, but we're gonna go straight to our next round table with the corporate chieftains beyond the one we had uh, joining our panel today. It's great to see you. Uh, thank you for joining us.